new new lineup in, in like January, beginning of February, but I mean, don't know where that will go ahead because there's normally um, about 200 usually members of the public there, so mm -hmm. I can't yeah. see them having that this time in January, you know. No, no. And Kittuck side, we're not, we normally go to the year. Um, we didn't go there last year because it didn't have enough funds for us to go there, but I can't see even that taking place this year either. Because mm. mm. that's East Kilbride, so I mean, mm -hmm. can't see these things taking place at all. Yeah. Hey, Hi, Roy. One of my pals from the Geology Society builds just joined yesterday as well. This is a big foot. All right. <laughs> is, is Eddie Carpenter signed in? No. Right, so he must know be. I, I sent him the link in that, but he's maybe no, no doing it this time for, you know. Um, because I've put on the only intro thing about Eddie's anniversary talk, but yeah, <laughs> I presume he's no he's no on it, so he'll not be doing his anniversary talk then. Yeah, so that's true. Well, that's, I suppose that's half past now. Do you want to give him an idea? I we may as well. We just nearly half past. Oh, I'll need to shout out to Dave. <laughs> Dave, it's nearly half past seven. <laughs> right, I'll just I'll just start because there's no point hanging about if nobody else is coming. Right, good evening everyone and welcome to another CAS webinar. I hope everyone is still keeping safe and well. It has been decided to keep the webinars going till the end of the year for now, as we don't know yet when the bank hall will open. I mean, I did ask the local councillor, Catherine McClyman, and she said, probably November but that's no our certainty so and the way things are going that will probably no happen at all um so because everything's on the verge more more lockdown restrictions um right but I will keep everyone informed of any changes if if I hear if it is opening or whatever and I will also be emailing the members and non-members this week the account details and thought code for paying our membership fees online. And I will also attach the registration document for new members to sign. Um, right, I, I am awaiting uh, the, the, the speaker for the 21st of September getting back to me as to whether they're able to uh, give us a talk on that date or not. Because Dr. John Davis said he would have to, have to see and have to think about it. So he's not got back yet. If not, Roy said he would give us another one of his talks. So tonight we have Eddie Carpenter. Oh no, we no get Eddie Carpenter, sorry. Right, tonight we have Andy Dave Devi with his filming A Solar Cycle 24. Right, so and it, Andy is a fifth generation coal miner from Wakefield, West Yorkshire. Educated as a mining surveyor and as a chartered mining engineer and was a colliery manager in Doncaster and Scotland in the 1990s. He became interested in astronomy from an early age due to having a bedroom with no roof and later started with binocular observing until he got his first series telescope in 2004. He became a member of MSAS in 2006 and everything went downhill from there. <laughs> a visit to his late cousin, Christina Rosanna Devi, an MSc astrophysicist at Keel University in 2002 permitted his first observation of the sun in hydrogen alpha light. And from then on, he was totally hooked. He bought his first P, he, fought, he bought a PST in January, 2005, 
and where the weather has permitted, he has made daily SOAR observations as part of the BAA SOAR observing program. He started imaging in 2009 and made the front cover of the BAA yearbook for 2011. He has had articles published in Astronomy Now and the BAA Journal together with about 40 articles in electronic magazines. He was the first guest in the Let's Talk Astronomy video series in 2011, shortly before he moved to southern Spain. He is, a, he is proficient in outreach activities in English and Spanish and had his first article in Spanish published in November 2013 and recently has just had his first book accepted for publication in English and Spanish languages. He has posted hundreds of solar activity animations on space weather and achieved the front page. He also gained permission from the head of the Global Oscillation Network Group program to use their data from seven separate sites to make movies of solar activity and house them on his thesolarexplorer.net website that he has run since 2010. So please give Andy our usual warm Kaz welcome. Thank, thank you for that. Andy, I'll just make you the host. Okay. Can you explain, Andy, what a bedroom without a roof is? What, what? A bedroom, a bedroom without a roof. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Pharrell sings about it in his song, doesn't he, nowadays, that room without a roof. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought Alice and Amanda might have edited that one out. <laughs> 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 okay. Andrew, I think that you should have the host permission now, if you... Wait a minute. <coughs> uh, share screen, just do it. Okay. Shall we mute ourselves? Oh, yeah. Mute. Mute. Andrew's currently locked, so I presume he's trying what's, to get the What's happening? Up. What's what's happening? We're all here except the speaker at the moment, I'm afraid. Yeah, he's, he's disappeared. Ah, I've unmuted myself because I want to talk and yeah. see where folk are. It's maybe lost internet connection. Ah, right. Okay. Mm. I mean, because I think at times in Spain the internet connection's no good. No, what is he in Spain? Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, he's in Spain. Ah, he's in southern Spain. Wow. Dave, what are you doing? <laughs> you're, I can't, you're, you're, mute, unmute. Hi, we're supposed to be on. I was putting the light on. <laughs> <laughs> I usually fade quietly into the distance as the mic goes on, you might notice. Uh -huh. Yeah, I put the light on first. Because I know when one of my, my friends, Sarah, when she lived in Spain, 
in during our uni year. Uh, mm. She had problems when we were doing Skype, but would just oh, okay. just cut off. Mm. <laughs> because my internet cut out the day as well, and I'm thinking, hope it doesn't it cut out the night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can do anything real, I just have to wait for him. Aye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Aye, technology, these things are sent to try us. <laughs> yeah, As people always say it's good when it's working. <laughs> uh. Well, we could sing, maybe. Right. Sing, them do know a song. <clears throat> oh, 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 oh. I don't oh. think so, Janice. No, <laughs> I but the whole think, room. <laughs> think of something, <laughs> an old song. I'm like a squeaky wee miss. <laughs> what? I'm like a squeaky. We'll meet again. What about we'll meet again? <laughs> don't oh, know what I... um, well. No. <laughs> but I don't know we'll meet again. Oh no, I, I, this I, is recording. I can talk about something if you want. Um, the only thing we've done recently out of doors is um, in Cumbria, they're trying to get um, set up um, a, a sort of a dark sky for Cumbria and different places, mainly places like RSPB and Cumbria Wildlife Trust who've got outdoor places, are wanting to um, get dark sky status in one of several levels, you know, from the, the uh, urban sort of situation down to uh, a proper dark sky like you've got uh, in the south of Scotland, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, you got uh, actually C Cumbria Wildlife Trust got in touch with us to ask if we could help. Uh, and Graham and I went down about a month ago, well, three or four weeks ago when there was no moon. And we met the chap in Kendall who was like organizing this for Cumbria and he had a light meter with him and I took some pictures and uh, uh, especially straight up you know to the Milky Way that sort of thing and also around to show the light in different directions in the direction of Keswick and Penrith uh, and you got quite a good meter reading and that was only one of you know, we'll probably go back and do it again uh, in the winter when we've got uh, still a sky is less sort of movement of the atmosphere and so on but mm -hmm. um we, uh, we do several meetings uh, several sort of um, measurements like that then we could get that particular site awarded a dark sky status of one of the three or four levels um mm. it comes into and uh, so it's the first time we've done this and uh, i'm sure i know that others other places we've been have talked about it and in fact the RSPB Gulfstair which is particularly dark not far from Carlisle or Bank mm -hmm. near Carlisle they've already got uh, a dark sky status because one of their rangers a few years ago was interested in astronomy and he managed to get them um, dark sky status I'm not sure what level them and uh, so that's something we've been involved with recently when we could at least get out and look at the skies because <laughs> there were only four of us five of us out there three went from our Three of us from Border Astronomical Society went and uh, met this other fella in the car park at where we normally set up our telescopes when uh, we're doing an outdoor event there. And what we normally do is uh, the outdoor event st st starts in the pub, which is on the A66 between Penrith and, uh, and Keswick, uh, and where we do an introduction, a um, big PowerPoint about what's up there tonight, that sort of thing. And as long as we've got a, a good sky, we then go up to the car park and, um, and do some proper observing. And in those events in the past, we've had 20, 30 people turn up. Uh, it's been quite successful, even when we haven't had good weather, because we, you know, can all, we've always got, we've got plenty of stuff to show them uh, what we do get up to at other times. Anyway, that's just a little bit if uh, contribute to the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Now, are you asking to do doing it, but can somebody way? try texting Andrew? I'm doing it now. Ah, good on you.
Have you been asked to help in that sort of way with dark sky status for outdoor, you know, for organisations or not? Um, not really. I've not. We've not had any emails or do with that, you know. Because mm -hmm. we, well, where we are, we are. We don't really have um, that many clear skies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just stuck between the two biggest cities in Scotland. So I mean, yeah, yeah. it's one of the well, worst bits, it's really, isn't it? Many no, years ago, yeah. when we first built our observatory, one of our founder members, Bob Millard, is still with us. He needed quite a lot then about dark skies. He was, um, <coughs> he, he researched it all. And because of his work with uh, Carlisle City Council, you know, quite early on, we got lamps changed from the old <coughs> sodium lights. And of course, more recently now, we've got the LED lights that throw sort of 90 odd percent of the light downwards. And uh, it's much darker sky, just where I live in the suburb of Carlisle. Yeah. Right. Than it was in the past. It's a lot uh, better. Uh, Samantha, do you have his phone number at all? I've only got his email. Oh, mm. right. Oh. You, you what? What did you say there? Sorry. Have you got his phone oh, no. number? Um, oh, hold on. I'll see if I've got it. Um, on anywhere. Oh, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, um, but he's, I can't text him, I can only email him, I've done that. We'll see if he gets back to me. Um, I'll have a look and see if, I, see if he put it on. Hmm. Yeah, I might put it on his uh, email somewhere at the bottom. If so, I can text him. Hi. <clears throat> Well, that's a shame because uh, I listened to his talk a few weeks ago and he gave a talk to uh, Astro Society down in England from Spain and he had no problem at all. That is no. Um, no, I don't. No, the first lot of emails that I got from him. No, it's no. There isn't any. Right. <clears throat> no, there isn't any. Okay. And I don't mm. think there was any on the on the the, the short bio he sent me. I'll check right enough. Uh, he's got my details, but it. I've got nothing from him. No, there's nothing even on the on the oh, short trial. He's coming he back, here he is. Is he coming back? Good. Yeah. He's coming back. Excellent. Right. right, on your cells or what? Where is he? He's just, I've just admitted him back into the meetings. Right. Excellent. <laughs> Andrew. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 We don't have when, video when, yet. When I press share screen, my screen just went a bit like a, you remember the old television when you could just see a snowstorm? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I, I've had to power off and come back on again. So, okay. oh, oh, it, it just takes a few minutes. So, um, I'm going to try it. If you give me share screen again, and I'll try again. Okay. But I've got I've got another laptop fired up just in case. Okay, you're now the host. Okay. Sit down. Oh, lie down. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see you again. Yeah, screen. Right. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Why down? Have you got me? Yeah. <laughs> Who are you talking to, Lynn? <laughs> Paul. Right. I've yeah. Just, I've just got to open my talk now. Just bear with us a oh, second, because uh, I, I had everything set up before, but. Uh,
If you wonder what that picture is, that's the guys loading iron ore onto ships from well, the base. Well, haven't, you're not on the right share screen yet. We're just seeing you on camera at the moment. Okay. I'm, I'm just opening my, uh, my talk. Just launching PowerPoint now. Okay. <laughs> <There's Lynn's dog. laughs> that, that's never happened before, but sod's law, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> Lynn's, Lynn's dog. <laughs> At the moment, it's just—it's quite an old laptop. This one, so it's just loading up. So, uh, what I'll do is, until the PowerPoint starts, I'll just give you a little bit of, um, like, an overview. Um, the things I'm going to be talking about are a few journeys. One, one is um, a journey from being a, a total novice. Um, into astronomy and then uh, more specifically into uh, solar astronomy and basically I got into it so much so that um, I decided to, to go for a complete lifestyle change which was uh, to, to retire early at 55 which had always been a plan and then to move to a specific area where it would afford much better opportunities to uh, to pursue the solar and other astronomy interests that I've got. So, hence, that's the way I'm now talking to you from southern Spain. But along the way, there are lots of little side roads that I will be talking about to, to try and keep it more interesting for you. And, uh, hopefully entertain you a little bit because I'm, I'm not certainly not a typical astronomer so I'm just open the powerpoint now now that's open so This computer's very busy. <laughs> Bear with us. Dave, can you remember to mute as well? You're the only one. That's At the moment, I've got Zoom and it just seems to want to give me a thumbnail view. So, ah, wait a minute. Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. Right. Have you got me? Um, have I got me on shared screen still? Sorry, still just you on video. You've got you, you've got me on video, right? Because I'm yeah. um, I'm going to hit share screen again. F fingers crossed, we're okay. Okay. That's the shared screen started. Have we got, have we got? That's it, we can see PowerPoint? your PowerPoint screen now, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, 
Okay, I, I think from last time there's probably three or four seconds lag from here before. Um, now, hopefully you can see some post flare loops running. Can can you see that now on animation? We've got that. Yeah, uh, it comes up fine. Yeah. Okay, we can start. <laughs> okay. So, the first question is why solar astronomy? Number of aspects to that. One, we're obviously very close to the sun at one astronomical unit, and it's a big target, roughly the size of a full moon. So, depending on what equipment you're using, you can see either large structures on small scale or small structures on large scale, depending on what magnification. There are lots of different wavelengths that you can use, and it is the most dynamic and for me, the most fascinating target within the solar system. Another aspect is you're on the night shift. <laughs> um, it's better for your health, you're not having to stay up well the early hours of the morning and um, then trying to catch up your sleeping pattern. And another offshoot is that uh, if you get a bit of a suntan, you've got higher generation of vitamin D, but not too much. So just a little bit about the solar cycle. The, the solar cycle switches from high to low roughly every 11.3 years. But after the 11.3 years, it actually flips polarity as well. So the true solar cycle is technically 26, sorry, 23, 22.6 years. Uh, from uh, from low to high. At the moment, we are in an extended low period. So as of today, there are no sunspots. So at the moment, solar activity is quite weak. And um, we've had some fairly reasonable promises, um, a few small sunspots, but nothing major, basically since 2017. First cycle, um, was set from 1755 to 1766. Um, that was um, discovered by Johann Rudolf Wolf, which he published in 1852. So you're talking almost a hundred years after, but he was based, he was uh, making his observation or his analysis based on Henrik Schwab's observations. So what I'm going to do now is just show you my equipment progression into solar astronomy. So originally I started in 2004. Um, presumably, if you were interested in astronomy back then, we had a major event, which was the transit of Venus, 8th of June. These, these are events that there were one 12 years, sorry, eight years later in 2012, and then you, there's above a century to wait so for the next one. So I think I'll probably pass on that one. But um, what I did to observe that, I, I, I bought a 10 inch uh, Newtonian telescope and I built a plastic card, almost full aperture filter with. Um, by the filter paper, the optical type, because back then I wasn't imaging, but I were able to put my telescope in front guard and basically I watched the transit from end to end and I were making uh, pencil drawings and I enjoyed it immensely. Um, if I remember rightly, it were about a six hour event. In 2005, um, a firm called Coronado built their PST, which stands for Personal Solar Telescope. And this small telescope made hydrogen alpha observing within the facility of people with even small budgets. And um, I ordered one in January 2005, and there was a, a huge sunspot complex. I've put a picture of it here on the 20th of January. 
Now, my, my PST actually arrived on the 25th of January and had great hopes of seeing this. And then we were cloudy for the next three months, which is usually quite normal when you buy a new piece of astronomical equipment. And I'm sure you guys in Scotland will be fully, fully used to uh, that, that happening. So, most frustrating. So, before I bought any of these video cameras, I actually made a small frame out of aluminium and plastic to put, you know, you know these pocket digital cameras which everybody had back then. I mean, most people are using the phones or smartphones now, but they were the new thing at the time. And what I were able to do that with a the piece of plumbing connector that I got from a hardware shop, I were able to put my camera and plug it onto the eyepiece. So if there's something particularly interesting happening, I were able to um, plug it in into my PST and, and take these, nothing sophisticated, nothing technical, but a reasonable image for, for what I were using. Now, the other thing is the right hand image you can see the, is a purple color. That's a calcium K personal solar telescope that I got. And people of our age, we, we start to lose the blue sensitivity to your light. So younger adults and children can see calcium K images normally quite easily. Whereas unfortunately, as you get older, they fade <laughs> significantly. So what you're seeing there is a, a B2 solar flare, um, which is the small bright area to the top left hand side of those two images. The right hand, sorry, the left hand one's hydrogen alpha and the calcium K was taken a couple of minutes later and they originated from uh, sunspot AR number 956, which were actually solar cycle 23. So this is like a prelim to the talk I'm going to be doing. That's um, a bit of a close up of a C9 class solar flare I got on the 9th of June. Uh, 2007 from sunspot number 960 and I just took a number of pictures of it no real sequence no no real thought to animations or anything like that but years later I, I came across them when I was uh, doing some um, data storage I thought hmm I wonder if there's any movement in that so sorry that, that's the calcium K of it Ah, must have missed that slide out. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah, so um, I were able to make a, a, a small animation run. Now, what I'm showing you here is my first attempt to put in three wavelengths of light together as a portable solar telescope. The left one with the blue ring is the calcium K one. The right hand top telescope is the hydrogen alpha and it's fastened to a 70 mil Skywatcher refractor with a VADA filter on the front. So if you just look to the, uh, into the objective, sorry, the eyepiece of the white light Skywatcher telescope, you can see a, a Philips 2 cam that are imaging and my first attempts were putting a laptop, as you can see, into a cardboard box set upon a trampoline. <laughs> uh, but um, I wouldn't let my daughter go on trampoline while I were doing it. So, that system, which were actually held together by a piece of laminate floorboarding. Um, actually fits into that small traveling case, as you can see. And that little setup was my hand luggage for every holiday. I did a, an article about it, which were published in um, Astronomy Now, that were back in 2009. And if you look there, the central bottom image, you can see the small frame that the camera went into. And I got one of these umbilical cords to uh, 
to take the image without disturbing the camera so it, you didn't get camera shake. The lower left hand image you can see we, we uh, the MSAS is Mexborough and Swinton Astronomical Society which I'm a member of and we used to have a we still do have a gazebo which we go to the summer fairs to do solar outreach and obviously being able to demonstrate the sun in hydrogen alpha or white light uh, is an advantage and from that system we actually generated a lot of funds for us fundraising activity because you can't see for that that little kid child's t-shirt but there were a donations bucket below it yeah, that's just for your information and we generated a lot of new members as well so it's, it's a good way through outreach particularly on a nice sunny day um i know in scotland it, pre-COVID there are lots of summer fairs so possibly it's an opportunity for you to think about for uh, for fundraising and for generating new members but everywhere we went I always got a queue I still use the same system today with a small number of modifications I bought a double stack unit for the um, 40 millimeter hydrogen alpha telescope. I switched the 70 millimeter sky watcher for an 80 millimeter Williams optics, added some larger focus knobs onto it, and uh, I think I upgraded the plastic card sun shield. But very, very portable, including tripod, you're talking less than 10 kilos. So, uh, oh, wait a minute. So um, that has gone on holiday all over with us. Um, I then did a bit of an upgrade. Uh, I'm getting really serious. <laughs> um, you can see these triple stack small telescope in the foreground. And um, I've then bought an EQ6 extended the bar so I could put a lot more weights on it and then went on to grossly overload it as you can see. Um, the central telescope is a um, Takahashi TOA 130 refractor which I still use today. The top telescope is a Coronado 90 millimeter calcium K-line and it's, it's a rare beast is that one. Um, I think they only built 10 and the one I've got is actually number one so a um, bit of a collector's item that one and then the the bottom telescope is a 90 millimeter Solomax hydrogen alpha with um, a second filter attached to the front of it um, which was a bespoke double stack unit mentioned in the introduction and I was delighted to um, get the front cover picture. What you're seeing there is a huge coronal mass ejection. Its dimensions are height equal to the earth moon distance, length double that distance. And that was a rapidly leaving um, plasma ejection. And a, a bit later on in part two, you will see an animation of that. Um, the other thing I do, every image I take or every animation I make, I orientate them to the correct solar orientation. And also, more importantly, I date stamp them with the universal time. Without the universal time, they're pretty pictures but of no scientific context. With the date and time, they're useful scientific records. So if, if you do take solar images or, or even your lunar or, or planetary, always date stamp them and time stamp them. I did a 30 minute video for the Let's Talk Astronomy series through um, a local astronomy suppliers near Rotherham called Rother Valley Optics. And that was a, um, 
a run through showing how to image and uh, animate the sun. And it was all done in one take. So that's just um, behind the scenes. I timed all the um, animations to run. So Dennis on the right, he was asking me questions and then we got the animations running. Now I was having them on that uh, the microphone is set there above Dennis and that thing that you can see above me were a taser that to, trying to keep me in check, but it did, didn't work. Now, hopefully you can see that running. Uh, um, that is a M6 class solar flare with a plasma loop. You're seeing the same image repeating and it's, it's, a, it's an animation of about four to five seconds. That made the front cover of uh, Space Weather website back in September 2011. So that were a couple of months before we set off to, uh, to Spain. This one here is an M7 plus solar flare. And when the animation runs, you'll see a loop fracture. At that point, the local temperature increases from about 6,000 Kelvin up to a couple of million degrees. And the thing that's causing that is when the magnetic energy converts into thermal energy for a short period of time. And, and that's basically what a solar flare is. On, on the high resolution image, there's some very faint magnetic arcs that you can see running above the flare. And, and when the flare blasts, it runs straight down the center of the tunnel. I believe that that animation was uh, including one of the BAA presidential addresses, but I didn't attend the meeting. I can tell the screen's just uh, changed because I, I can sometimes see reflection in your glasses, so that helps me a little bit, so I, I know it's landed. So this is the move into Spain. It was a huge leap of faith um, from being comfortable living around Yorkshire and a short venture to live in Scotland for four years. Um, Everything went into storage, put the house up for sale, bought a van and a caravan and moved to Almeria, a place called Cabo de Gata, which is Cape of the Cat. That's right on the bottom south west corner, sorry, southeast corner of Spain. And um, the area where the arrowhead is, there's actually going to be a total solar eclipse in August 2027. I'm about uh, 40 kilo, sorry, 60 kilometers north of there. So my observatory location, I'll get 99%. So I will be going south for totality. But hopefully I'll see more than what I did in 1999, which was basically nothing but clouds and dark. Um, I don't know if any of you went down to Cornwall. It was most disappointing. We waited years for it and uh, the clouds had to ruin it. So from Cabo de Gata, I did a interview on Radio Sheffield, BBC. And uh, also January 2012, I think I did the furthest south event for Stargazing Gazing Live and uh, we've got 140 people in attendance. And uh, at that time, I was still reasonable with my German. So uh, I did it in English and German, that one. There are a few photographs from the day. Um, the front row, all Germans, once they'd moved the towels. <laughs> Uh, just joking. Uh, 
but um, there, there were a queue, a very, very long queue uh, for the solar telescopes. Other people on site were bird watchers that have got binoculars or spotter scopes. And in the days beforehand, I trained them up on astronomical targets. And we, um, we, we did some planetary viewing. Um, we also did some deep sky stuff as well. Um, so that there were a range of targets. So basically the way it was organized was solar viewing from about 5 p.m. We then had a break for uh, an evening meal in the, the bar at the campsite. And uh, they served two meals, which were sun meal and a moon meal, which were basically chicken and chips or fish and chips. And uh, I remember my comment to the bar owner that, that uh, I didn't want a lot of space on my plate. I've got a big appetite. <laughs> so I had some very spe specific goals for Southern Spain. I'm very driven and very goal orientated. Um, also, what I tend to do is get in among with the people that have the skill set already. So I don't waste time reinventing wheels. Um, learn from the best that's, if, if you get that opportunity. So obviously we want to set up a place for home and have the right place to set up for an observatory. Because I've always had a great passion in outreach, and for me, the greatest gift you can give to anybody is inspiration. So um, my initial goal was to start doing outreach with some of the Spanish schools instead of just the English school that I used to do within two years in Spanish. And I, I did achieve that goal. Um, with some lessons at Sorbas Institute of Higher Education, which is again north of Almeria. I also had some very specific sol solar targets. So they were to film some post flare loops, and you'll see these in the second part of the talk. Coronal mass ejections, and other, the other one that had alluded me to if possible, to capture some X-class solar flares. And solar activities, it's a little bit like fishing. The more you do it, the more you're going to catch. But there are other techniques that you can use for prediction, such as space weather website shows you the predictions and also the numbers for sunspots, the sunspot numbers and also prediction of potential activity. There's the NOAA site where you can measure the intensity of solar flares. Also, you can look at the last three days of the graphs and you, you may see a pattern that's emerged um, as to how, how often and the intensity that a particular sunspot is giving off flares. And then the other one is the Global Oscillation Network Group website, which has got the seven ground braced hydrogen alpha telescopes. And you can look at a, an animation over the last uh, 24 hours activity or just over. So you can see if there are any particularly dynamic prominences or filaments or so, sunspots. The, the other thing that um, we wanted was to get a suitable house so we got sufficient accommodation for us friends to come, come along and visit. Um, if, if, if you like my equipment, uh, when, we get, when you see the setup I've got, that, that uh, is open to yourselves as well uh, um, at Clydesdale, which I'll, I'll talk about towards the end of the, uh, the talk. So, from Alela del Campo, we, uh, sorry, from the campsite, we moved to near Alela del Campo to live in a small Spanish rural mountain community. My next door neighbor is a Pastor de Cabras, which is basically a shepherd with goats and sheep. He's got 400 animals and he's now my best friend. And we are fully integrated into their family. So we share Christmas, New Year, weddings, birthdays, and 
you, you know you've been accepted when you get adopted by a Spanish family and uh, brilliant opportunity. They're lovely people. And the best way I can explain the culture is it's a little bit like going back in time 50 years for the cultural values. The, fa the family dominates Spain and the head of the family is the matriarch, which is either the grandfather or the grandmother. All the children are compliant, very, very respectful. And sadly, where, where we lived in uh, Yorkshire, a lot of that aspect had, had, had gone, it had been diluted over generations. And, and I believe it's continuing to go that way. But Southern Spain, particularly the real Spain, it's still like that. And it's, it's, it's a joy to see. So what I'm showing you now is a map of the Sierra Fibrales mountain range. So that there is Calar Alto. That's the Institute of Astrophysics Observatory in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute in Germany. It is the largest observatory on mainland Europe and it's about an hour's drive from where I live. Um, got a number of friends up there in the astrophysics community. So as I, as I was telling my own society, I can now say I've got friends in high places. That's where I live. Um, we're in the foothills, so my altitude is 360 meters above sea level. We're only 15 minutes drive from the coast, um, five minutes away from the uh, main motorway, which is the E15, uh, you'd probably not be able to see it on resolution, um, which is the yellow line between the two arrows on the right hand side of the image. And one of our friends came over to stay with us and then went and bought there. <laughs> so um, from 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 our society, they just came and enjoyed it that much. They just that were it. They were, they were, they were having some. So this is one of five domes at Calar Alto Observatory. That's the largest, which is a three point five meter telescope. The dome is 30 meters diameter and 43 meters tall. It's, as you can see the cars at the bottom, it is very, very big. Oh. I had a picture inside, but uh, I must have put wrong version. I'm sorry about that. The telescope inside weighs 150 tons. It's got a mechanical guidance system that's accurate to 0 0.1 seconds of arc. Now to put that into context, if somebody held a one pound coin on top of a mountain 30 miles away from where you are, the telescope will still stay within the circumference of that coin as it turns. It is very, very accurate. The mirror itself weighs 12 and a half tons. And below the mirror on the first floor, they have a, a facility for casting and polishing, sorry, for, sorry no, for casting, for regrinding mirrors, similar mirrors. Its altitude is 2,100 meters. So, that's, this is our a permanent home. That's an altitude. We're in an old lead mining village near a town called Bedar. I've mentioned we're five minutes from the motorway, 15 minutes from the coast, 35 minutes from Almeria Airport, which is great under normal flying conditions. I'm a passionate uh, strength athlete as well, even at my age. So. I'm only 15 minutes from one of the best gyms in Spain. Oh. And then another advantage, um, we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago. Midsummer's Day, 
21st or stroke 22nd of June, at our location, we get just under five hours of night. Whereas yourselves, you may not even get astronomical twilight at your northern latitude. So for deep sky images, even mid-June is good over here. So, bought our house in uh, late October 2013. The first thing I did was put a metal pier into the garden and concreted it in and it's full of concrete. And then it's camouflaged with those um, tufts of grass or what's called esparto grass. And there were a huge export business at one time and that's where all the wicker uh, baskets and hemp ropes were made from esparto grass back in the um, 19th and early 20th centuries. So what I did then, you can see I'm starting to clear off and I put some rails into the floor. So you've heard of sheds with roll off roofs. Well, I've actually built a roll off shed. So that's me and my mate um, Robin building it. And it's, it's dimensions is basically it's an eight foot cube or 2.4 meter cube. And in its forward position to the left, the telescopes are covered. Obviously, once it's rolled backwards, all the telescopes are out in the air for uh, either solar or uh, nighttime viewing. The floor plate has to be lifted out. And those horizontal parts are, they're called turnbuckles. But another place you'll see them is in, in the corners holding a boxing ring together and for tensioning. So that's what holds the observatory to the floor. So to move it backwards, I remove them bolts, which takes me, well, basically from get opening the door to set up images, I can do it in three minutes. Not quite as fast as, as fast as changing a tire on the Formula One, but I've got it. I've got it well choreographed. And that's that's the column with the floor in place. It's a wooden built shed, heavy duty wood, and I've put rebars in for security. There are other security features, but I'll, I'll not discuss those. Um, but. The whole thing weighs about three quarters of a ton because being on the top of the hill, we do get some very occasional, very strong winds, so it has to be resistant. And um, another thing about Spain is you have to treat your wood every couple of years, otherwise you'll finish up with a pile of sawdust with, with the insects and different things that will try to attack it. There, that's me sat outside on a typical observing session. That one, my little friend Alfie, who's no longer with us. At the table, I've got a, a mobile, basically it's an observatory. It's got a, a blanket for covering my head. You can see there's a, a battery operated fan on this, this side of it. And there's a solar panel at the front to keep the battery charged. And that's, that's for keeping your, compu your computer cool, but also you need to be able to see the screen because when you're solar imaging, inevitably the telescopes start to change temperature. So every few minutes you need to just keep checking your focus until, until it's, it's reached thermal stability. Well, that's my view from inside the observatory. There are, there are no buildings or lights for about four miles to a south. Uh, just the motorway, which there's no lights on it. And street light is something I've come to shortly. The battery pack, the yellow thing, that's well, just to reserve, because initially, uh, years ago, Spain were notorious for mini or micro power cuts. So, um, first few years, what I were doing is 
charging battery and running the mount from the battery. So I know I've got a continuous supply, but all that seems to resolve itself. So I've not had to use battery for the last three or four years now. Um, you can see at that time I was still using the white EQ6 mount. I then upgraded to this. This is an EQ8. Again, it's a Skywatcher mount, lo lo lovely mount. Um, that has got a, a carrying capacity of 50 kilos, and that's what's on it. Uh, the plastic shields and tin foil just to help reflect, keep the heat away from the mount. And also you can see I've got some plastic to keep the heat away from the counterweights. There's also some cardboard sheet as well, just below the three telescopes. The reason for that is the more heat you can keep away, you help maintain your local seeing conditions. And the other thing I've done is if you can see on the floor, there's some very small um, light co colored gravel chippings. Again, that helps keep the heat away so that you, 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 you make the best of your local atmospheric seeing conditions. This shows the setup from inside the observatory. At the moment now, there's a, a guide camera on top of it, and I use PhD guiding. So when I, when I do deep sky stuff, um, I can guide usually to within one second of arc, either side of the central point. There's a, on the plate it's mounted, in the middle of the telescope is a red dot laser finder. And um, the reason I use that is if I'm planetary imaging and wanted to start imaging early before it's dark enough to see guide stars to, uh, to do your calibration run on your, on your mount, I, I can use that and I can start imaging um, even during daytime on, on the planets. The, the, the little plaque on the back wall um, just to the left of my telescopes is our local Mexman Swinton Society and underneath it says Southern U European Observatory on it. This is a 30 second exposure taken of the Milky Way and I've put that into um, Astrobin and that then superimposes the uh, constellations so you can see um, my location is 37.2 degrees north so I'm probably 15 or 16 no more, probably 17 or 18 degrees further south than yourselves. So <clears throat> you started to see um, some of those southern constellations, uh, telescopium there, and also um, we get a good view of the galactic center. Oops, sorry. Right. That's the finish of part one. Do you want to ask questions just to break it up after part one and then I'll go into part two? How, how would you like to play it? Yeah, I could ask a, a couple of wee questions, but I, I'm not sure you may well be covering it in part two anyway. So that's, it might be better actually just to carry on into part two. Okay, we'll do. Sorry, it is stuck. Uh, somebody, there's somebody called Eddie wanted. Do you want me to admit him? Because I've got the screen. Yeah, just yeah. like that. Okay. Uh, That's Eddie that we were expecting earlier, yeah. Okay. Uh, just want to have a little talk about the street lights because. Initially, when we arrived here, we were in a beautiful dark sky location, but they'd put some street lights 
that nobody in the village wanted, set four metres above the floor um, with 150 watt sodium bulbs in. So I set, uh, we have a neighbour of uh, association, Association of Vecinos, it's called, and I put a project together and wrote a, a series of three technical papers to our mayor in Spanish to see if we could get something done about the lights because we've got some of the best of skies in Europe and the light were coming all the way from the millions of light years or even closer and being ruined by some lights that were set four meters above the floor. It didn't, didn't, didn't ring right to me, didn't that? But also, um, when I unpicked the Spanish constitution, I found out under Article 45, everybody has the right to enjoy their environment, and anybody that's spoiling it has the duty to rectify it. <laughs> Which was most amusing. But also, when I pointed out the fact that if we put full aperture LED lights in, it would get an electricity saving of just a small matter of 83%. So the bill for our village, which was 6,000 euros a year, uh, would go down to about 1,500. So, um, or, or even less than that, sorry, my math isn't very good tonight. Uh, so those arguments swung, but the mayor liked it so much that the project was taken to the Deputation de Almeria. And this is now being done across the whole of our Almeria, and I think it's it's actually moving across Spain as well. Um, but we've got the skies back. The image to the right, you can see the difference. The the last of the bulbs were the ones that affected me most. Uh, there were five still remaining at that time, so you can see them uh, them very bright orange lights compared to the full aperture cutoff ones uh, to the right of them. The reason for the van is um, that was the contractors changing those last five. And bear with us a second, it's stuck again. This is after the uh, street lights, the, uh, the comment that we've just had, uh, you know, I forgot its name now, <laughs> it'll come back to me. Comment there. Near the eyes. Can you hear me? I lost the link there. Yes, I can hear you. Can, can you hear me okay? The link just yes. dropped out there for some reason. Yes, yeah, okay. we can hear, hear you okay. Okay, thank you. Um, what I did, I, I made a movie of its setting and... Andrew, you've lost the shared screen. We're just seeing you. Oh, okay, just a minute. I'm back. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, wait a minute. So we've got the shared screen back now, Andy. Have we got it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, th I think we had a, a weak internet connection. Um, okay. I made, I made a movie of that comet setting over the town. 
and uh, the, the change majority of the uh, street light. So you can see we've got these very, very dark hills now. Okay, I'm going to escape out of that one and go into the next presentation. Has that come on? That's it, you're running now, yeah. Getting really hot here. <laughs> okay. So, what I'm going to show you now is some of the um, movies of the most spectacular solar activity that uh, I've filmed so far. Like I said in my introduction, I've, I've had to shrink these down to three megabytes so that you'll see the activity, which unfortunately, um, you lose a lot of resolution, but at the end I'll show you the my web page where you can have a look and see the high resolution imagery. So, if you remember, we spoke about coronal mass ejections. So I'm going to show you a few of those now. That there were only five frames I took of that. Um, not initially, not with a the view of making an animation because I, I photographed that event before I'd even uh, made any uh, animations. Uh, but that, that was lifting off. Um, I just wish I'd have stuck with it and continued filming, but um, I didn't have the knowledge or the experience back in 2010. But a huge event. This one I filmed with a standard PST and um, a black and white DMK webcam. Um, you can see there's a huge arc lifting off. Um, that was back in July 2012. And it was actually a wider field event. So um, I took a Barlow lens out to get a wider view of it and, and kept filming it. As it, as it went and escaped into uh, to form part of the solar wind. But uh, that just shows you if any of you have got access to a personal solar telescope and a, and a webcam, that, you know, you, you, you're quite capable of getting that from Scotland. This one here, um, this is a, almost a four hour event. Um, it, it's, it's a shame because it, it runs very, very smoothly. Um, but obviously governed by internet speeds. I, th I think it's possibly my own upload speed that may be uh, causing it to stick. Um, just short, short of four hours. And basically, if there are any large structures on the solar limb, photograph them. Because if they're large, they're generally unstable. And when they're unstable, you may be lucky enough to catch millions of tons of plasma uh, lifting off. Uh, I've just got a, a message up saying that my internet's gone unstable. Uh, I hope they haven't turned it off. Are, are you still with me? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's working fine. Yeah. This is again an, another. Uh, even higher resolution image of that one. Um, 
This one in 2013. Uh, as well as seeing the main event, you can see all the spickles, uh, the small structures that, that penetrate from the uh, chromosphere um, into, into the uh, solar corona. Um, but the, for me, they're just a joy to watch these. I can watch them for hours. And when, when you're filming them, you have no idea of, the, you, you, of what the real dynamics are going to look like and, until you do your first animation run. Now, obviously, if you get any clouds, that would cause breaking sequences. And you may get a smooth run, and then it jumps to another part. And that was one of the reasons I moved to southern Spain, because we get basically nearly 300 clouds three days a year. So it's ideal for, for doing this type of, uh, of uh, astronomy. This one here is not quite a coronal mass ejection. It's a huge filament, about half a million kilometers long, and a ribbon flare fractures it, and then it recouples and starts falling back again. Again, that particular one is filmed with a personal solar telescope. So, you, you know, not, you're not talking megabooks to to make what I, what I think is a very, very reasonable solar animation. Post flare loops. The, these are the um, arc shaped magnetic structures that follow a solar flare. That particular one, the, the flare occurred during the hours of night and I was straight up first thing in the morning and it had, it had caused some um, beautiful loops. And if you look, the plasma is sticking to them and it runs down each side simultaneously. So you're seeing basically solar rain there um, as, as it, the plasma sticks to the magnetic field lines and uh, runs back down to the surface. That was about a three and a half hour event. That's a, uh, a single arc. That's, that's the highest resolution I can get. I will film in at 3.2 meter focal length there. Um, so you, you, can, you can look at the, uh, even the small scale uh, structures within a, a, a large feature. Again, this is also at 3.2 meter focal length. And what I've done there is I've overexposed the surface so that you can see the faint details within the uh, magnetic loops. This, this one is a M4 class solar flare that I captured. And you'll, you'll see the, um, the flare occurs and then it triggers a tunnel of post flare loops. I, I don't know how stable these are running for you. Um, it, it's obviously running okay on my, uh, my PC, but uh, uh, I'm not sure what internet uh, you're getting. Uh, it's working well, we can see them nicely. Oh, okay, thank you. So, White light also offers, offers, offers the opportunity for animations and to convert any of your refractors to white light, all you need is some um, BADA filter screen, which costs about 20 quid for an A4 sheet, which normally will do you for three or four separate filters because they, they only have a finite life. So. If any of you have got a, uh, a black and white webcam and want to try some white light animations, I'm going to show you what, 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 what the potential is. This is a, uh, a sunspot filmed at four meters focal length. And um, the dark area is the umbra. The gray area is the penumbra. And that penumbra is, is comp composes a series of 
they're like filamentary structures that actually run into the uh, the center of the umbra and if you do a, a one hour animation you can see that movement running in the general area you can see the uh, convection cells boiling each, each one of those is about the size of scotland and the last five to ten minutes before the next one replaces it and that's how the heat from the center of the sun is convecting out to the surface I've boosted the contrast on that um, so you can see the, the convection cells and I'll just let it run for a, a few more seconds if it stabilizes you'll see the plasma running in now if you wonder why some images are sharp and others aren't it's the difference in atmospheric scene that's causing it if you get stable air no 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 difficult thermals you can get some nice crisp images if you've got unstable air and the scenes all over the place it, it, it's a waste of time trying to image because you can't even get a good focus on your telescope so atmospheric scene is a, a great consideration for basically any type of astronomy this is a a huge sunspot complex so you can see that you can get some very small structures like those little uh, small spots around it or you get some of these very large structures i think that one was going on for the size of jupiter from one end to the other this this one was much bigger than jupiter i don't know if you're aware but um 20 i think it was 2017 ar 2192 it gave us a Two week tour across the uh, the face of the sun that we can see and I'll, I'll come back to it because it was a, a, a huge sunspot the largest in the last 30 years it actually released six X class solar flares did this one calcium K is the blue light this is partial disc with quite a number of small sun split spots there are actually uh, two small solar flares that, that go off on that um, what one of them is in the lower left between those two sun spots if it runs it's sticking a bit on mine is this one and uh, the other one is between the uh, two sunspots on the top right the solar flares are much more in bright and intense to see in hydrogen light but you do catch them in calcium k light but there's not as the strength's not as significant that's a still image of that sunspot ar 2192 I've put a still, still image in so you can see the huge scale of it. Um, while we're that on the sun, I was absolutely exhausted because I was in my observatory from sunrise to sunset, uh, gathering data. And then as soon as sun went down, I was then processing images. <laughs> so after a fortnight, I was worn out. Um, but it was very, very rewarding. So going to X-class solar flares this was a X1.1 the first, first X-class flare I, uh, I caught you can, you can see the, the, the brightening um, all my sequences on, on my website I put the start and end of it um, depending on the number of frames I take, um, if it's um, highly dynamic, I'll, I'll image, I'll, I'll do an image sequence every minute. Um, if it's something that's fairly benign, like those uh, lift off prominences, 
I may be doing an image every four minutes. Um, and when I say imaging, I'm usually probably taking about 500 frames and then uh, I will make a still image out of that, which I then make into these animations. A bit higher resolution, that one. Um, that, that actually was a uh, an M7 class flare, that one. And again, from that very large sunspot, as it were, approaching the limb. And I thought, it's, it's, it's let a big flare off, so that might be it. But in fact, it wasn't. And uh, after that, I, uh, I imaged a X2 plus solar flare. Now, what I'm showing you there is a still from YouTube. And uh, that's what I see on my screen while I'm imaging. Uh, so as you can see, I've got quite a large partial disk. Uh, on that scale on my screen, the, uh, the full disk will be about uh, 0.7 of a meter across. Um, what I'll try and do is when I finish the talk, I'll go into YouTube and I'll see if I can uh, pull that video out, which is it's only 35 seconds, but uh, it's interesting to see what, what, what me as the observer actually sees. And that's the, uh, the animation I made of it. Again, it's a huge area. That, that one seems to be sticking a little bit in PowerPoint for some reason. Okay. Alice and Amanda mentioned at introduction that um, I gained permission from the head of the Global Oscillation Network group, a guy called Frank Hill, back in 2011. So this particular solar flare, as you can see the time, is going from 21 to 2300 hours. So this is from one of the uh, American telescopes at Big Bear Solar Observatory. And that was the largest flare from that particular sunspot, that AR-21, uh, I've forgotten, uh, 2192, sorry. Um, and that was an X3.3 flare. So I made a movie of it. And uh, that, again, that's one you can see on my website. Because prior to me doing this, they were just dumping the data. Um, or, or it were being dumped from the net. So when I approached them, they were delighted and sent me uh, uh, an email back saying they've got all these scientists working for them and yet nobody thought to come up with this idea. So fresh pair of eyes. That is the two works um, X-ray flux for that particular Sunspot AR2192. As I mentioned, it's the largest in 30 years. But where you can see those red lines going across the um, black horizontal line, that's where they've gone across the threshold from M class, which is medium sized flares, into the X class flares, which are extreme flares. This is one from 2017. This is the biggest flare I've uh, captured. That was the second largest flare of solar cycle 24. Um, X8.1. A couple of days later, there were a, an X9.2, which was the largest flare of that particular cycle. So at X9.2, it's not regarded as a super flare. Anything above text, sorry, X10 plus flares are uh, classed as super flares. Occasionally, you may be lucky to catch a solar shock wave. This is a M2 class flare, but right from the center of the screen, you'll, you'll see a shock wave run to the northeast 
just a bright area. You can see, I can see it on the iRes, you may not get enough resolution, but that's one of about four solar shock waves I've caught. Now, this one was from cycle 23. That was a X6.5 plus solar flare. And that is actually from one of the Gong solar telescopes. But clear as a bell, there's a huge shock wave there. So I think it made the headlines Sunquake or something like that. But they are targets that we amateurs, they are available to us. The last of the um, things I'm going to show you are large filaments or big filaments up for you. This particular filament, um, what, what I've done just to show a, a difference in contrast, that's an inverted image in hydrogen alpha. It looks odd, it's, it's not something that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, I tend to make my uh, movies in, uh, in uh, positive aspect, but occasionally, I, <clears throat> excuse me, occasionally I do, do some negative aspect ones just to show the dynamics. Now, this next one, that's a still image with, I don't know if you've seen it before, it's called the solar ruler. And it's a way of measuring features on the solar disk. Now, a guy who I've had quite a lot of correspondence with, a French guy called Guy Burry developed it. And um, working with him, we, we made this English version. The central scale is in 100,000 kilometers. So it starts from zero in the middle, going out to each side. And by the time you get to the limb, you're nearly a million kilometers from the center, as you're seeing around, around the curve of, of, of the sun. The circular disk at the bottom is the size of planet Jupiter. That little dot above it is the size of the Earth. To the right, on a slight incline from vertical, there's a, a line which is the scale of the Earth to the moon distance. So basically, if you put the Earth in the center of the sun, you'd have to go twice the moon's distance to escape the sun. It is that big. And, and as you probably know, um, the sun is quite a small star. But what I've put on is somewhat some arrows here. So the white long feature at the bottom is the filament. So as you can see, it goes from just over about 435,000 kilometers to the left of center to just under 600,000 kilometers to the right of center. Now, if that were a straight line, that would be a million kilometers longer because it's curved, it's significantly longer than a million kilometers, which is effectively three times the Earth to the moon distance. So the other thing about this scale is, you see the rings around the edge of it, they are 50,000 kilometers of altitude. Now, if this was a clock face and you looked at between, say about 10 o'clock, there's a, a very faint filament there. And I've just put a, a red arrow on to show it to its height. And that's reached an altitude of about 70,000 kilometers in height. There, there are some others as well. Uh, there's one at eight o'clock and there's another one down vertically at between five and six o'clock. They're, they're quite faint and quite small, those other two. But this is a very, very useful tool for measuring solar features and particularly those tall prominences as, as, that, that, uh, that you've seen earlier. Just to show you my, the capabilities of, with my equipment, as well as doing uh, animations on uh, solar imagery, I also like doing uh, planetary animations, particularly rotational animations. The, uh, the first one on the left, um, one of us friends, uh, Alexander Hart came over with Rosemond and uh, stuck her camera into my TOA 130 
and uh, joint project, we've got the uh, shadow and transit of Io with the great red spot on Jupiter there. And uh, the right is obviously a, uh, a Mars rotational animation. The other great thing about Spain is being set like 17 um, degrees further south. The planets are 17 degrees higher in the sky. So you get, you, you're looking at them through um, much less atmosphere. So the atmospheric seeing conditions are much better. And Mars is particularly good at the moment. Also, um, I've been venturing to deep sky imaging. This was my first attempt. Um, at the moment, the, the camera I use is a modified DSLR camera, which is about 15 years old. And uh, if I'm out imaging at 30 degrees night temperature, which we do, we do get, um, have a lot and lot of noise to deal with in PixInsight. Uh, so it, it makes it a difficult process to, uh, to image, but uh, there's a project coming shortly on the horizon, which I'll come to later in the, uh, in the talk. We, well, I've nearly finished now. That's just the, um, the center of the Eagle Nebula. Um, again, it's by tie from our location. One you'll all be aware of, which is the Orion Nebula. And the trick is trying to get it without overexposing it so you can see the, uh, the bright stars in the, in the middle of the triangulum. Trapezium, trapezium, sorry, trapezium. Um, just to show you a bit of local wildlife, if somebody mentioned bird watching, um, I think it was David, weren't it, earlier on, and Alice PB. We get a, a lot of um, eagles flying over. That, that one's Benelli's. We get occasional vultures coming over, uh, flamingos, um, a lot of bright bluebirds called bee eaters, which are very, very nice to see. You get some very bright uh, yellow and brown golden Oreos. You get those in the area. Another one, uh, the hoopos are, are quite, uh, quite spectacular. But the, the other thing I maintain is a, um, a small pond in my garden, which brings the, lot, the south of my gardens open. And uh, we get the wild goats, the ibex, there in every night drinking. Occasionally we get the habalia, which are wild boar, they come in for a drink. And uh, we're, as you can see, the lower left image, that's the reason why we uh, inundated with wild tortoise. And uh, they're very nice to watch coming in and uh, they have a drink and uh, eat everything they can and then disappear. Um, the other thing we get is um, the case that we get visitors from our society. And uh, we've got a couple of extra bedrooms in the house, so we, we can take up to four guests if, uh, if anybody fancies coming over for some B&B having a play on the telescopes. The, the one thing I can promise you is if any of you come, there will be a lot of humour. <laughs> lots and lots of humour. Um, but uh, these were Mexican Swinton astronomers. Just a little bit of a summary. Um, so, solar Cycle uh, 24 officially finished in uh, May this year. Uh, we're now getting activity solar cycle 25. That yellow graph is the consensus of predictions graph, which is going to be um, of lower intensity than cycle 23. Um, so um, the, the sunspot numbers are going to go up to about 120, which is a monthly sunspot number. Um, Because solar minimums basically stop my in the tracks with my solar astronomy, I've unpicked the local history and um, the industrialization of this area. And that book's been published in English and Spanish edi editions. I've got the ISBN numbers for them, con uh, consecutive numbers. 
and unfortunately it's, it's delayed by COVID, but release date is um, March 2021. Yeah, a, a mere 150,000 words, large format, and nearly 500 photographs. So what's next? Um, we had a guest speaker at um, Mexburn Swinton Society, who's a, a guy called Sean Reynolds, who's a superb astro imager on uh, deep sky objects. And he talked to us a lot about Project Hubble Palette and the different filtration and different types of cameras and things. So that's, that's the route that I will be going next. But I'll be getting a, a, a very good deep sky camera and the uh, palette filters. Now, what, what I did with my local society, I had them on that I'd actually got my first Hubble palette image. So prepare yourself because it wasn't what they expected. So basically, I took a picture of a palette and ripped Hubble on it. <laughs> um, it was just a bit of a light-hearted way to finish, but uh, at that I think I've uh, finished. But what I want to do is just draw your attention to my uh, website. So if you type in all one word, the solarexplorer.net, you'll see my animations. Uh, there's dozens and dozens of pages on it. There's a whole astronomy library with the um, all the digitized books of monumental works like Galileo, um, even uh, Nicholas Copernicus's works are all on it in chronological order, spent months and months and months putting together. And if you click on it, you can see scanned images of the original books. It's all, it's all on there. Um, there's four pages of tutorials where I explain how I do what I do. Um, the second paragraph, fifth and sixth last words, it says Astrobin page. If you click on that, that's where all the Astrobin is where I've got the 100 plus gigabyte, sorry, megabyte animations that I filmed. So if you want to see the high res stuff, it's all on there with, with the links. Okay. So, I've just got to uh, try and. Pardon me. Yeah, just a second. I'm, I'm trying to stop sharing the screen now. Oh, oh wait. Is that excellent? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> have, you, have, have, you, have you got have you got control back? Uh, uh, Unmute. I'm not sure, but it oh, should right, be Roy, have you, have you got it? Yeah. I'm looking at the wrong side of the screen for you, Roy. <laughs> no, it's okay, I think. So, sorry, I'm linked, Alice. Oh, that's fine. I, I, had go, I had to go to Chelton. I'm expecting to be back at six o'clock, and I got back at eight o'clock. Oh. <laughs> All right, mate. <laughs> right, I got a couple, just a couple of things to talk if you like. Oh, here is it, here is yeah. Is that all right? Are you the range of it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, just... Okay. Yes. Right, an anniversary, September the 7th, 1836. Mm. It, was, it was the death of John Pond, P-O-N-D. All right. He was the sixth astronomer royal, and he lived... Uh, a few miles south of Bristol, purely local chap really. He spent much of his time uh, studying stars, working out magnitude, positions, uh, working out all the figures for them. When he became Astronomer Royal, uh, he did a very good job at Greenwich. He updated a lot of the instruments, introduced a lot of new ones, including the time ball. Do you know the time ball at Greenwich? I think they, they raise it and drop it at one o'clock every day. Do you know that? Uh, I've heard of it. The, yeah. the, Greenwich, <laughs> the Greenwich Time Ball. Anyway, 
For a while, he's in charge of the Nautical Almanac uh, until bad health took over. So that was the anniversary, 1836, September the 7th, the death of John Pond, the sixth astronomer royal. Right. Right now, for this one is a bit cheating, really. I said I was going to do Cornish astronomers, and lots of books say this chap was Cornish, but he wasn't actually. Um, I think he was born in Dorset. Uh, he spent a lot of time in Cornwall doing his observations. John Bradley. John Bradley. Do you know of another chap called Bradley? He was, he was a nephew of James Bradley. And James Bradley was famous for, when he, well, he was also an astronomer royal, but he was famous for doing the aberration of light. I mean, John Bradley did some of the work with him. Uh, did a lot of observing, particularly in Cornwall because of the clearer skies. He went to observe the transit of Venus, working out distances of the planets uh, fr from the Nizzard point in southwest Cornwall. And then he got a job working for the Board of Longitude, taking part in many expeditions. And he spent most of his later life working at Greenwich. So that was the so-called Cornish astronomer, John Bradley, who spent a lot of his time, as I said, in Cornwall, but I don't think he was born there. As far as I know, he was born in Dorset. So anyway, that's something the only one I found out about at the moment. Um, John Bradley, nephew of James Bradley, the Astronomer Royal, who worked on the aberration of light. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get some tea now. Yes, <laughs> good idea. Yeah. Uh, anyone get any questions for either Eddie or Andy? Yes, I've got one for Andrew. Right. Do you record in both hydrogen and calcium simultaneously? Did you hear that? Did, did you, I think I got... Uh... Hydrogen and cal calcium simultaneously. Yes, do you, you record can. both simultaneously? Well, um, I tend not to do because I, I tend just to use one laptop. Um, yeah, that was the next question. I was going to ask, do you use the same recording cameras and do you have two recorders or laptops to do it? I've got three laptops and one went down, uh, which were a fourth. Um, I have, I try to build in redundancy, so I've got a DMK21 and a DMK51. Um, so that, that gives me two options, uh, but also I've, I've got a, um, a point grey colour image, high speed. Um, Grasshopper camera as well. The, another question I had, you mentioned having four foot focal lengths. How do you achieve that? <laughs> what meter? Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 te the, the telescopes are the um, TOA 130 is a one meter focal length. Yeah. I use two barlows. Oh. <laughs> one I unscrew the lens and, 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 and uh, screw it straight into the camera, right. which then goes into a second two times barrel. But for the planetary camera, I've actually got a five time, high quality five times barrel, so I can image the TOA 130 at five meter focal length of that. Thank you. <laughs> and are, are these, uh, do these give a good quality image, the barrels that you use? Yes, yes. Um, what I tend to do, if I'm planetary, I, I use a, uh, what's called fire capture and I, I shoot 10,000 frames and usually pick best 50% to, to, to process. And any imaging though is dependent on the quality of the scene that you got on the particular night. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And I was going to ask, as you said earlier on, that you know, there's plenty of websites you can look at that tell you when the sun is very active. But I mean, is it still just luck to a certain extent where you manage to catch these pictures of the actual flares going off? And 
presumably it, the ones at the edge. It, 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 it is quite right. a rare event that you managed to get there. Yeah, right. If if you've got a big sunspot, you've got lots of bundled and concentrated magnetic field lines, so you've got a high potential for um, solar flares. If you look at the NOAA graph, um, I, I did show you one that I put stitched together with a fortnight on uh, that uh, AR 2192. And if you look, there were, there were a solar flare being given off roughly every four hours. And there were between C and X class flares. So um, yeah, I know if I were putting my time in, I were going to catch flares. And I, I, caught, I actually caught. Uh, three of the x class flares of the six from that one. Um, but again, it can be pure luck um, because I, I, I have been imaging right until sun's gone behind the hills and um, a flare's gone, then a big one's gone off 10 minutes after I've lost the sun. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, nothing's happened all day. So it, again, it's down to patience and statistics, a bit, a bit like fishing, I suppose. But the thing is, being here in southern Spain, the probability is if there's something good going off, I'm going to get a cloud three day, whereas the number of times I knew something good was happening and you know, we just drowned it out in, in uh, South Yorkshire, where I used to live. And it, it was frustrating enough to make me move. <laughs> So can you actually just leave the camera running then and auto tracking running on the telescope or do you have yeah, to? End? Some do that. Um, I've got, I've got the, the capability of doing full disk image by putting a 0.5 reducer in. And I have done that and done a, a, a seven hour run. Uh, I mean, I had, to, I had to keep going and making sure I was still on centre. Um, with with my image, uh, but that's how I've, I've actually made some uh, seven hour full disc movies right. by by doing exactly that. Thank you. Again, with the sun, the range of targets and the opportunities are enormous. And and, mm. and I've, I showed you, I've, I've caught some spectacular stuff with. Um, a basic PST, which at the time you could get them for about 500 quid, which for a, a, a dedicated solar telescope, not a lot. Yeah. Um, and people can, I think there are Quark, which are Daystar filters that you can buy to couple into uh, all the telescopes. So um, hydrogen alpha is much more affordable than it was 10 years ago. And, and, you know, um, again, I will go back to the outreach element. If you've got a hydrogen alpha telescope, you can, you can take your society to the local parks. And if you're lucky enough to get a sunny day, you might just catch a new member. Seriously. Yeah. I think, I think we've got about a dozen new members uh, over a two or three year period. But, um, we had a phase where um, we were doing solar discs uh, for a, a, a two pound donation, you know, and a, a talk I did in some solar activity. And seriously, we made thousands out of them. We got a, um, um, a mount, I'm trying to think of the name of it. I got, it cost us, we got it cheap, but about a 12,000 quid mount, which, which, we, which we got from solar viewing. So on, on top of that, there's a um, Celestron C14 mounted parallel to TOA 130 that I've got. So if, if you get out there among people, I mean, you, you'll probably gather from what you've seen tonight, I'm a bit of an open personality and I like to have a laugh and joke with folk and get everybody involved, in, especially little ones, kids. And if little one wants to have a look, mum and dad will come and have a look and, uh, and you, you know, you generate it from there. And the greatest thing we can give to anybody is, is um, 
inspiration, isn't it? Yeah. And you, you never know, one of them little ones might finish up as a, as a future solar physicist based on that event, it can happen. Don't miss that opportunity. Mm -hmm. so one of the other astronomy societies I'm in, the Glasgow Association, they run big outreach events in the, the centre of Glasgow. And, mm. and that usually <laughs> attracts, you know, several hundred people. And as you say, yeah, yeah. a good fishing expedition really to get people interested. Yeah. And it's, well, again, what, what I would suggest come is with their if, parents. If, if it's something that you're interested in, then what either one or a few of you go to one of the Glasgow events, see what they're doing and have a chat with them. And, you know, don't, don't reinvent any wheels at all. You know, see what works and copy. <laughs> Plagiarism rules. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Nope. No other questions? <laughs> right, because see, we do, as I said, we do like New Lanark and normally Kitoxide, but we have tried at uh, both of these events to like sign up people to join the society, especially at the New Lanark one, because that's um, near where we are in Forth. Mm -hmm. But um, they say they'll come. They say they'll come to the next meeting, they, they get the newsletter free for a year and they never come to any of the meetings, even though they say they're going to turn up and they never, they never come. And I mean, these, these events, especially New Lanark, that attracts, as I say, 200, sometimes 300 <clears throat> people, including youngins, but nobody ever, we never get any any new members out of it, even though we, we get yeah. the, the names and their email addresses for, yeah. for the newsletter. All, 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 all I can think of is, is there any advantage you, of giving them the, your newsletter for a year? That might work against, if they've got to come along to meetings or join the Zoom meeting, for example, or the, the other thing that uh, we did a lot at Mexburn and Swinton was, uh, public viewing evenings at the observatory, usually the weekend round first quarter moon. Right. And when they can see, have a, a good tour of the moon or uh, see some planetary or a few deep sky targets or open or close star clusters, it's that personal contact. Them, 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 uh, them photons of come all that way across space and the first thing that they stopped them is your eye. You know, it's, it, it's, you've got to build those wild factors into your talk to, to, to draw. The, the, the I will have <laughs> them, usually at New Lanark, they're up in the roof garden, weather permitting, but yeah. the last two or three years, the weather's been terrible and they're not allowed up in the roof garden. So all that we can show them through the scopes is whatever is in the room that we're in, like yeah. whether it's a metal, circle thing yeah, or yeah. whatever you know because yeah. there's nothing I mean we we don't have our own observatory either because there's no point because the weather you're lucky if you get like five nights in the year really oh, okay sometimes even less than that for clear skies so yeah. I mean it's not that we haven't tried it's because even yeah. with Lance chairman we tried, but we yeah. just we never we never had the weather. One one year yeah. I think news were in it in it um, Lanark Lock and it was chucking it down the rain. Yeah, we did a lot of solar outreach obviously when I was yeah. over yeah. with you. Uh, they were constantly going out doing solar outreach. So it was there was a very limited response and as you say, I do remember sitting in the car with John and a couple of others. Uh, and through the pouring rain for hours and hours waiting for a crack to appear in the cloud. Doing all that. So we've tried a new, new Lanark and, and Kittuck sign in an extremely successful outreach. You know, we get hundreds and hundreds and yeah. loads of people sign up for the newsletter, you know, and they get the, when the newsletter is quite, you know, basic, it basically just tells you 
when the next meeting is and just keeps you informed. Um, so it's to, to attract them in, but yeah, they're all fired up with enthusiasm and then they yeah. just drift off and nobody ever turns up. It's, it's, mm. it's bewildering, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. In um, previous years with Border Astronomical Society, <laughs> we always used to take part in stargazing live and uh, the different events that came on um, at National Astronomy Day and, and things of that sort. And that attracted quite a lot of people to the observatory where they could see the telescope, but only very rarely could they look through it <laughs> and look at the weather. Um, but it did generally get us two or three more members, but it never lasted, you know. And in recent years, there haven't been as many of those things taking place. Uh, we do get interest when we do the outdoor events arranged by other people, like, the, uh, like RSPB, and they will, um, they will put out uh, and, and astronomy night at their nature reserve uh, and limit the numbers and we go along and do a presentation for them and that occasionally gets us one or two more uh, people interested but yeah. quite honestly they never last very yeah. few never last yeah. and uh, we're generally the same 14 or 15 people that have yeah. gone there for years. You see, another thing we did at Max Prince Winton we twinned up we uh, uh, a local RSPB reserve, uh, nature reserve, and we did a number of stargazing events on their premises, um, checking telescopes down, um, which were pre-arranged events for either a sol solar viewing days or evening viewing days, and we were able to use the lecture room and, and give them a talk on astronomy, whether it was solar or, or deep sky imaging, and people were able to go out and look at the telescopes again, again weather permitting. And again, we've got a few members from that. The, the other one that we did a lot of as well was going into the lo local schools for outreach events, which is one of the things I enjoyed doing. I've done all and, that. Uh, yeah, let's yeah. not go to them, but yeah. we never yeah. got nothing yeah. out of it, really. You know. yeah. Yeah. Is the catchment area is a bit of a problem for Lanark because although it's a reasonably large town, you know, it's it's quite isolated. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's thirty odd miles from Glasgow, so people won't travel that kind of distance. It's it's not like you know Mexborough and, and you know when you've got sort of a large urban area. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's surrounded by a lot of countryside, and folk just don't want to go. They just want to travel. Mm. Mm. I get a lot of um, uh, a lot of requests. Well, not a lot of requests. I say I go back to the same places that every year just about yeah. four or five local primary schools to do the space topic because a lot of the staff don't know much about space and you're getting what passes from one to another and that mm -hmm. is a good way of getting our income in that they you know they give us a donation because yeah. we don't have a charge for people yeah. to the observatory um, especially younger people and um, we just ask that when there's a talk on um, that they donate a pound um, yeah. So yeah. we get maybe twelve pounds on a night when one of us gives a talk. But um, in spite of that, we still have quite a bit of money in in, in the fund because yeah. of the outdoor events we do generally, and the school events that. Uh, I, I, I think one of, one of the things that we we did because back in two thousand five two thousand six, um, I was like the lead coordinator for. Uh, fundraising and we, we got a can you remember the blue peter appeals where they've got like a graph on wall where the, before christmas where, where, where they were going up every week so everybody knew what their objective was and i, I did a fundraising event which were a, a sponsored weightlifting thing i did and everybody thought this is not going to work until i turned up with two and a half thousand quid i raised <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I, yeah. I, should, I should have said and, and, that when that, that, that was just just I think what you've got to do is throw all the mental barriers away and just do free thinking and even if it don't work never quit just you know, stick with it and the, the other thing we used to do is after every event we did a, a formal debrief what went well and what didn't so that you're able to modify your approach because 
I mean, the definition of frustration is doing the same things and expecting to get a different result, isn't it? So, what else? What else? You've got, that's what you keep asking, what else? What else? And pe people buy into things if it's fun. So, one of our initial objectives was, right, how can we put the fun back into astronomy? And just humour and laughing and joking. And if, if, some, if somebody comes away from something and first of all, they've had an experience that's brand new to the life that some of them they're not going to forget. But also, if they've, they've had a good laugh while they're there as well, you know, uh, what you need to do is get a comedian on board, you know, and a retired club, club comedians, <laughs> you know, just, just something, that, you know, so just even daft stuff. Um, but if you can get the fun into it, that's, that's how you attract people. But the, the other thing I, I would think about is, all the young ones, it's what they're interested in is social media, isn't it? And so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what, what you do on that platform for for publicity or, or but it's just fresh ideas, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we've got our website, you know, and then we've now got our YouTube channel, which yeah. we, we record the the, the Zoom meetings on and yeah. we upload them uh, the YouTube channel. So, yeah, but I think our our main our main disadvantage um, compared to where you are is the weather. So it doesn't matter what we yeah. can plan an outreach event or whatever. Yeah, and it could be snowing, chucking it rain high winds or a combination of all three so <laughs> no i mean and then what, but what, the what, 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 yeah. up and then they're moaning because yeah. they can't see nothing yeah. and then they're blaming us but then it's yeah. not us it's no. in the lap of the gods <laughs> yeah well if if you've got an outreach event you've always got to have a really good plan b Aye. Whether it's images or a, a laptop presentation onto a screen. Oh, I, we ha they have that at New Lanark. They do yeah. their, <laughs> they, their education side, do, do the talk, yeah. uh, the presentation, and we operate the telescopes, usually on the roof garden. But as I say, this last year, <laughs> the weather's been terrible. And I don't think, really, even when you were Chairman Lynn, I don't think we had that many clear nights at New Lanark. Right. No, they didn't. No. Yeah. No, we had one really good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ten years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Years ago, I remember one really good night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Every ten years, you get a night. Right. <laughs> yeah. One of the things. One of the things that uh, we find is I get quite a few scout guides, cub groups getting in touch, wanting to do the star badge. And oh, yes. I them along to the observatory, oh, and I do a presentation on that. Sometimes we go to their meeting, but then afterwards we invite them to the observatory. Now it's very rarely that you can see anything from the observatory, but we've got a very big 16-inch telescope built in the 70s. Yeah, and it's nice. massive, you know, three-meter tube, and they go upstairs and they see that, and we can show them it driving, and they're really, they you know, they're just taken by it. It's not much good for, uh, say, photography now, but it's mm -hmm. great for looking at the planets the odd time that, or the moon, um, the odd time the weather's good. And that, that means we get three or four times a year, as I say, and sometimes they come back again two years later, um, they come uh, to, do, to do the star badge. And, uh, just, so just we do thinking. tend to get kids into the observatory and instill mm -hmm. some fun in it. I, I, we, I do a lot with 3D images of Mars and that sort yeah. of thing, the, the uh, Voyager expeditions. And th they always seem to enjoy it, even if they don't right. get a chance to look through the telescope. Because yeah. I, I believe even Airdrie Astronomical Association, their observatories not used that much, you know, no. from what I gather, because the weather's not been great either. So they mm -hmm. have the, and Tweedsdale Astronomical Society and mm -hmm. people, they've got their own observatory, but their members very yeah. rarely use it because of the weather conditions. So when it is like maybe clear, they, they just 
out their own back garden because it's mm. usually only clear for about half an hour and then it's clouded over. So can, can I put one idea, idea on the table for you? <coughs> if you've got a fixed date for an event, you're stuck with the weather Nine. on that date. Mm, yep. If you've got a flexible date and a system of rapid uh, notification via Twitter or Facebook or what have you that, that could be changed at the drop of a hat, your statistical chance of getting a better night is much improved. Mm. We've tried that. You know. We've tried everything. <laughs> We've tried that as well. Because uh, I even post about the meetings on, although I post the meetings on Facebook as well, you know, yeah. other astronomical societies and about these, these Zoom meetings and our normal meetings when, when we mm -hmm. back to having them, but we never get anybody really turning up. You know, they say they'll turn up, but they never turn up, so. Well, what you need is some organized trips to Spain. <laughs> so once they know that someone is coming over to Spain, then they might be interested. <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Let's all go to Spain. <laughs> yep, let's all go. Sounds like a society trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right, then, right, and uh, Mitch's gra gracias, Andy, for <laughs> your very entertaining gracias. and informative presentation. So, can we please thank Andy in the usual way? Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, Andrew. Very good. I was practicing a wee bit in my Spanish there. <laughs> yeah, very good, Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> you need a bit of work on the accent. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm still no great. And, and I mean, the Spanish chatter. Spanish, Spanish with a Lanarkshire accent isn't quite so good. Oh, <laughs> God, just you have Spanish accent. <laughs> even even Classy, Classy, the Spanish Spanish teacher, I mean, he, he goes, Yes, it's, it's getting there, you know, Amanda, get there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, not quite, but it's good. <laughs>